Hello, and welcome to Differential Equations. This is Lecture 28, Boundary Value Problems. Last time, we talked about computing the exponential of a matrix to solve linear initial value problems. This time, we're going to talk about equations where you specify boundary conditions instead of initial conditions. OK. So recall that we refer to a problem like y double prime plus p of t y squared equals q of t with y of 3 equal to 0, y prime of 3 equal to 1 as an initial value problem. because we impose conditions at some value of t such as t equal to 3. In this example. When we specify conditions at more than one point, so for example, if we had the same equation, but now we specified that y of 3 was equal to 0 and y of 7 was equal to minus 1, then we call it a boundary value problem. And we call these conditions boundary conditions. So informally, we often think of the independent variable as time in initial value problems and space or distance in boundary value problems. OK. For a more complicated example, Let's consider the Euler Bernoulli beam equation. So we've talked about Euler and several Bernoullis. Uh, this particular equation is work of Euler and Daniel Bernoulli, following earlier work of uh, Daniel's uh, uncle. Yakov Bernoulli. Uh, 
uh, this equation has become a cornerstone of engineering after being uh, successfully applied to the construction of the Eiffel Tower and the Ferris wheel, um, showing that it worked very well. So a beam is a structure having one of its dimensions much larger than the other two. So we might have something like a square, right? And then, right, of course, in real life, you might not have a square. You'd have like an H or an I, capital I shape, right? And let's... Right. And what we'll do is we'll pick coordinates. This where this is the x coordinate, this is the y coordinate, it's the z coordinate. Right. And uh, what's important is that the the cross section is. Um, well, it doesn't have to always be the same, but it has to be smoothly varying. So here we choose coordinates. That's in the figure. The x-axis is known as the neutral axis. And we suppose that the beam is submitted to a distributed transverse load, right? Call it Q of X. Which for us means a force in the direction of the C axis. Right. But notice that this force is supposed to only depend on x, right? If we further assume that the shape and geometry of the cross-section of the beam doesn't change. That each cross-section Is, is assumed to remain planar and normal to the deformed axis of the beam, right? So, so we're thinking that the beam might get deformed, right? But you'll have 
your neutral axis and the idea is that the movement has to be perpendicular to this neutral axis. So this is okay and this is okay, but you're not allowed to have something move like that or like that or anything like that. So here we're thinking that the, the force is being exerted like that, it's the load. Right, this uh, remain planar, we mean that like this, this square cross section here is on this plane, right? And after the movement, it's supposed to stay on that plane, that plane just being the plane perpendicular to the, uh, the neutral axis. Right? And finally, that the angles of deformation of the neutral axis are sufficiently small, then a good model for the, um, the flexion, it's called. of the beam in the C direction at position X is that it is related to the applied load by the Euler-Bernoulli equation, which says that you take the second derivative of W with respect to X, then you multiply it by E and I, I'll tell you what those are in a second. And then you take two derivatives of what you end up with, and that's supposed to be equal to the load. So here, E is what's called the elastic modulus, right? So this is about the materials. It's the materials resistance to deformation. I is the second moment of area with respect to the z-axis. So this is a geometric property reflecting uh, how points are distributed in the cross-section with respect to the z-axis. And the product EI also gets a name. This is known as the flexural rigidity. Okay, so if the flexural rigidity is constant, then the equation can be written E times I times the fourth derivative of W with respect to X is equal to Q, right? And if the load is also constant, 
then the general solution is of course very easy to work out. W of x would be a particular solution. So Q over E times I times X to the fourth over four factorial, right? That would be a particular solution, of course, assuming that E times I is not equal to zero. And then you add the general solution of the associated homogeneous, right? So four derivatives equal to zero, that means you have a third degree polynomial. So A plus BX plus CX squared plus DX cubed. Okay, so of course, the general solution this is a fourth order equation. So we ended up with four arbitrary constants that need to be determined. And so you need to give four conditions in order to determine these constants. And that's true even if, if Q were not constant, then um, we'd still expect that, right? So since this is a fourth order equation, we expect the general solution to involve four arbitrary constants, right? And indeed, assuming that E, I, and Q were constants, we, we found the general solution and it has four arbitrary constants. And so we need to specify four conditions to determine a solution. One typically requires two boundary conditions at each end of the beam. Okay, and of course, what boundary conditions you impose depends on what physical um, situation you're trying to model. So for example, you might have a fixed end, right? So the picture would look something like this. Maybe you have a, a wall or something, and then you, you fix the end or a pinned end. So here by pin, think that you have like a, a hinge or something like that. Uh, a simple support. So think of something like Stonehenge where you just have your big beam sitting on top of some rock. Or you might have a free end, meaning no support. Right, so the end of the beam is just hanging there. Right, so in this case, you would impose the boundary conditions W of zero equal to zero, W prime of zero also equal to zero. These cases, you would impose W of zero equal to zero, W uh, double prime of zero equal to zero. And this case, you would impose W double prime of zero equal to zero, W triple prime of zero equal to zero. So for a beam, which for example is fixed at X equal to zero 
and free at x equal to L, we'd have, right, and let's assume that the flexural rigidity is constant. So then our equation is EI fourth derivative of W is equal to Q. And we'd impose W of zero equal to zero, W prime of zero equal to zero. For the fixed end, W double prime of L equal to zero, W triple prime of L equal to zero for the free end, right? So this situation is what's called a cantilevered beam. Okay, so if we suppose that in this situation, right, for this cantilevered beam, uh, Q is also constant. So if Q is constant, then as we've already discussed, the general solution is given by this particular solution plus an arbitrary polynomial of degree three. And we can determine the constants. So for example, W of zero, if you plug that into here, you just get A and we're told that that's zero. W prime of zero, take one derivative and then set x equal to zero, you get b, and we're told that that's zero. Next, if you take two derivatives at l, okay. So if I take two derivatives, I end up with two c plus six d times l plus um, four and three, and so I end up with x squared over two, so q over ei, uh, x squared, so that's L squared over two, right? And that's supposed to be zero. And if I take three derivatives, evaluate at L, so that would be uh, 6D plus uh, Q over EI times L, that's supposed to be equal to zero, right? So from here, we can work out that D is equal to minus one sixth Q over E I L. And then if we plug that into here, we can work out that C is equal to minus three halves Q over E I times L. And so the solution is W of X equal to Q over EI times X to the fourth over four factorial minus L over six times X cubed minus three halves No, I'm, sorry, I'm putting those backwards, aren't I? Minus three halves Q over, oh no, L times X squared minus one sixth L times X cubed. No, actually this has an L squared and I was writing it correctly the first time. So sorry about that, this is uh, d the x cubed. So three halves l squared x squared, and then minus one sixth l x cubed. All right, I think I got to write that. Okay, perfect. So that's an example, just to show how boundary value problems are physically very well motivated, and that 
we solve them the same way we solved initial value value problems. You find the general solution of the equation, right? And then you use your boundary conditions to determine the arbitrary coefficients that were in your general solution. Okay, so let's consider the simple boundary value problem, y double prime plus y equal to zero, y of zero is equal to zero, y of l is y sub l. So here the general solution of y double prime plus y equal to zero is y of x equals a times cosine x plus b sine x. And y of zero equal to zero tells us that a is equal to zero, right? Because if you plug in x equal to zero, this is zero and this is one. So the other boundary condition, y of l equals y sub l, translates to b times sine l equals y sub l, okay? And there are now three possibilities. First possibility, if L is not an integer multiple of pi, then sine of L is not equal to zero. And so we can solve B is equal to Y sub L divided by sine of L. So the boundary value problem has a unique solution. Y of X is equal to Y sub L over sine of L times sine of X. Second possibility, if L is an integer multiple of pi, then y of L is equal to zero, right? Even before we know what B is, y of L is just equal to zero. So if y sub L is not equal to zero, then there are no solutions. This boundary value problem. So that's new. Right? If when we're working with initial value problems and we have nice coefficients, like here where we have constant coefficients, then we're used to having existence and uniqueness. Right? But here, you might have unique solution, you might not have any solutions. And there's still a third possibility. If L is an integer multiple of pi, and y sub l is equal to zero, then y of x equal to b times sine x solves the boundary value problem for any choice of b. So there are infinitely many solutions. Okay, let's look at a couple more examples.
if you have y double prime plus 3y and you impose y of 0 equal to 0, y of 2 pi equal to 0. So here, the general solution is y of x equals a times cosine of square root of 3x plus b times sine square root of 3x. Right, y of 0 is equal to a. So if that's equal to 0, that kills the first term. y of 2 pi um, is equal to b times sine of square root of 3 times 2 pi. Uh, so if we want that equal to 0, then we must have b equal to 0. So the only solution is just y of x equal to 0. Right? But we can have a very similar example. y double prime plus 4y equal to 0 with the same boundary conditions. Okay. Here, the general solution is y of x equals a cosine of 2x plus b sine of 2x. y of 0 is, again, a. We want the first boundary condition tells us that's 0. Now y of 2 pi equal to b sine of 2 times 2 pi, so 4 pi. That's equal to 0 for any choice of b. So y of x equal to b times sine of 2x is a solution for any choice of b, right? And so even though it's a very similar uh, boundary value problem, this one has infinitely many solutions. Okay. Let's go back to the Euler-Bernoulli equation. Let's write down the general case. I'm not going to assume that anything is constant. And suppose that we have the same boundary conditions as in the cantilevered problem. But instead of having uh, the right-hand side is equal to 0, I'm going to just say that they're equal to some constants. right? So suppose you're imposing that uh, at 0, w is equal to a, and w prime is equal to b. And then at l, second derivative is equal to c, third derivative is equal to d where a, b, c, and d are constants. What can we say? About existence and uniqueness. OK, so if q of x is not equal to 0, then we know that the general solution of the equation has the form Well, it's going to be some particular solution. 
plus the general solution of the associated homogeneous. So of course, I can't write down these solutions explicitly because I don't know what these functions are explicitly. But that's okay, just from general theory, just from this being a linear ODE, we know that the general solution is going to be a linear combination of four linearly independent solutions to the associated homogeneous equation. So the question, Right, coming back to existence and uniqueness, the question is, can we choose little a, little b, little c, little d to satisfy the boundary conditions? Okay, well, Let's rewrite that. What exactly is it we're trying to do? Well, W of zero is from this explicit form, WP of zero plus A times W one of zero, B times W two of zero, C times W three of zero, plus d times w4 of zero, and we want that to be equal to capital A. Then w prime at zero, so I'm just going to put primes on everything. That should be capital B, w double prime of L. Well, that would be just take two derivatives and plug in L. We want that to be capital C. And then our final condition is the W three derivatives of L should be equal to capital D. So does this equation have any solutions? It's the same as saying, can you solve this system by finding appropriate little a, b, c, and d? Okay, well, we've done some linear algebra now. So let's rewrite this using matrices. So here, the things that multiply little a are w1, w1 of zero, w1 prime of zero, w1 double prime of L, w1 triple prime of L, right? Little b gets multiplied by w2 of zero, w2 prime of zero, w2 double prime of zero, w2 triple prime at L. Then same thing with w3. and then W4. So we have that matrix and it's multiplying little a, little b, little c, little d. And then what is it we want it to be equal to? Well, on the one hand I have this a, b, c, and d, but I also have these terms, which don't get multiplied by any little letter. So these are outside of my control to affect. So I will move each of them 
to the other side, right? So I have A minus WP of zero, big B minus WP prime of zero, big C minus WP double prime of L, and capital D minus WP triple prime of L. Okay, so this is the system of equations that we're trying to solve. Right here we have, let's call this matrix capital A. Let's call this vector U bar. So this is a linear system of equations. And we know from our overview of linear algebra that uh, how to solve these. You solve this with um, Gaussian elimination. So we know that if the reduced row echelon form of the matrix where you start with A, your coefficient matrix, and augment it with this vector U bar, if this has a pivot in the final column, then there are no solutions. If it doesn't have a pivot, in the final column and has no free variables, then exactly one solution and if it doesn't have a pivot in final column and doesn't have no and does have and has free variables, then there are infinitely many solutions. Right, so in this example, despite not knowing what the specific functions are and what the specific solutions of the uh, homogeneous problem are, we're still able to, to deduce that these are the three possibilities for your boundary value problem. It might happen that you have no solutions. It might happen that you have exactly one solution. That's the only thing that would happen for the initial value problems. Or it might happen that you have infinitely many solutions. OK, so it's a theorem that uh, that's what happens in general for boundary value problems. For simplicity, we're only going to write it out in the case of second uh, degree equations. So here's the existence of second order linear value value problems. So suppose P of X, Q of X and f of x. Are continuous functions on the interval a, b. And let's call L our linear operator that sends y to y double prime plus p y prime plus q y. So let's consider the homogeneous boundary value problem where we have L of y equal to zero. And then at the left endpoint, we're going to have alpha one y of a plus alpha two y prime of a equal to zero. 
and at the right endpoint, beta one y of b plus beta two y prime of b equal to zero. And the non-homogeneous boundary value problem, where we're going to have L of y equal to zero. And the same boundary condition except that now we're going to allow it to be equal to capital A at the left end point and capital B at the right end point. So what can we say about existence and what can we say about uniqueness? First thing to notice is that the function y equal to zero always solves the homogeneous boundary value problem. It might be the only solution, or there might be infinitely many. The non-homogeneous boundary value problem can have no solutions. One solution. Or infinitely many. If it has infinitely many, then so does the homogeneous boundary value problem and if it has a unique solution, then so does the homogeneous boundary value problem. If it doesn't have any solutions, that doesn't tell you anything about the homogeneous boundary value problem. Okay, so why is this true? Well, it's a lot like what we just did for the beam equation. We know that the general solution of Ly equals F has the form Y of X equal to a particular solution plus little a times y1 of x plus little b times y2 of x. This is the general solution of uh, the associated homogeneous. Equation, right? So, Right. This is just involving this. So here, when I say homogeneous, I just mean Ly equal to zero. I don't mean anything to do with the boundary values. So now, just as in the previous example, to get a solution of the non-homogeneous 
boundary value problem. Little a and little b need to solve a matrix equation where we would have a1, y1 of a plus, not a1, alpha1, plus alpha2, y1 prime of a, and beta1, y1 of b plus beta2, y1 prime of b, and then here the same thing but with y2. times little a times little b equal to capital A minus the left endpoint boundary condition applied to the particular function. And then capital B minus the right endpoint boundary condition applied to the particular solution. Right. So let's again call this matrix A and this vector U bar. And so we know, hmm, I suppose I'm already using the capital A here for this constant. So let's use curly capital A for the matrix. And so we know from linear algebra that there are zero solutions, one solution, or infinitely many. Solutions. The same is true for the homogeneous boundary value problem, except that there, the vector u would just be the zero vector, right? Because this would be, both those constants would be zero, plus you wouldn't need a particular solution because you're working with the homogeneous equation, and so these would also be zero. And there is always at least one solution, right? Y of x equals zero. So the only thing left to prove is that how the um, solutions of the non-homogeneous and homogeneous problems are related, right? And that relation is the following. Suppose that C1 and C2 both solve the non-homogeneous boundary value problem, then Y equal to the difference between the two solves the homogeneous boundary value problem. Hence, if the non-homogeneous boundary, boundary value problem has multiple solutions, then so does the homogeneous. Right. And this relation goes both ways. If you have a solution of the non-homogeneous boundary value problem and you add a solution to the homogeneous boundary value problem, you get another solution to the non-homogeneous boundary value problem. So that establishes everything we wanted. Okay, so feel free to stop listening. That's everything we need for 
homeworks and exams and such. Uh, but let me tell you a little historical context. Right. Uh, today, I'll tell you about Niels Heinrich Abel, a Norwegian mathematician who lived from 1802 to 1829. So he has shown up for us uh, in Abel's theorem about the Ronskian, right? Um, for context, Laplace, who we've already spoken about, lived from 1749 to 1827. So uh, Abel is around at the end of Laplace's life. Uh, you may already know about Abel and know that his work is closely related to that of Galois. So just for context, Galois was alive from 1811 to 1832. Okay, so Abel was a Norwegian mathematician who lived in poverty and died tragically young. Uh, the early 19th century was not uh, a good time for Norway. Back then, the kingdoms of Norway and Denmark were united and had been with brief interruptions since 1397. They tried to remain neutral during the Napoleonic Wars, but Britain decided that a neutrality treaty that Denmark signed with France in 1794 was an aggressive act. And in 1801, Britain sank most of the Danish fleet. Despite this, Denmark-Norway avoided the war until 1807, when Britain decided that the best way to avoid Napoleon using the Danish fleet against it was to take it over. So in 1807, they attacked and captured the Danish fleet. Denmark-Norway then joined France's side in the conflict. The continental powers blockaded Britain and Britain blockaded Norway. These two blockades together devastated the economy of Norway. And then to top it off, in 1808, Sweden invaded and fought Norway for a year. Uh, so even though Norway won that little war, it, um, it still, uh, hurt the Norwegian economy quite a bit. In 1813, Napoleon was defeated at the Battle of Leipzig, right? So this is one year after Napoleon's army had been destroyed in the retreat from Russia, and he had gotten a new army of fresh recruits in France. So his soldiers were raw and disheartened. So they were defeated at the Battle of Leipzig. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars then ended for Norway with the Treaty of Kiel, this was uh, the um, Scandinavian powers and Britain signing a treaty. And in this treaty, Denmark ceded Norway to Sweden. Norway decided it didn't like that, so declared independence and then adapted a um, constitutional monarchy. But after a short war with Sweden, it agreed to elect the king of Sweden as king of Norway. So Norway was basically taken over by Sweden. The treaty also saddled Norway with debts to pay. So between the blockades, the wars with Sweden, and the incurred debt, the Norwegian economy was in tatters all throughout Abel's life. Abel's father was a poor Protestant minister who was involved with Norwegian politics and in fact helped write the constitution in 1814, the one that made Norway a constitutional monarchy. Abel was sent to school, but the school was not very good. And uh, things weren't looking good until, uh, uh, tragically, uh, the math teacher at the school was fired for punishing a student so severely that the student died. The new math teacher, Bernd Hombo, joined the school in 1817 and immediately realized the abilities of Abel. The school's primary focus was on Latin and the classics, so Hombo took to tutoring Abel privately in mathematics. With Hombo's encouragement, Abel worked through the works of, for example, Euler, Newton, Laplace, and Gauss. Then, in 1820, Abel's father died after having spent a couple of years unemployed and frequently drunk. Not only was there no money to pay for Abel's school, but he was also now responsible for his mother and family. Hombo both provided some financial support and helped raise funds that enabled Abel to enter the University of Christiana, this is in Oslo, in 1821. All right, so when Abel's like 19. Uh, 
Abel obtained a preliminary degree in 1822 and then continued his studies independently with further subsidies obtained by Hombo. Abel's first papers published in 1823 were on functional equations and integrals. In fact, Abel was the first person ever to formulate and solve an integral equation. Integral equation is exactly what it sounds like. It's like a, the opposite of a differential equation. Instead of me telling you things about the derivative of a function and asking you to figure out what function it is, I would tell you things about the integral of a function and ask you to figure out what function it is. This became a, a huge thing in math uh, a few years later, at the beginning of the 20th century. Abel was given a small grant to visit Copenhagen and talk with the mathematicians there. Uh, when he returned to Christiana, he tried to get the university to give him a larger grant to enable him to visit the top mathematicians in Germany and France. He didn't speak German or French, so he was given funds to remain in Christiana and learn these languages before traveling. During this period, he proved his most famous result, the insolubility of the quintic equation by radicals. Okay, so to see what this means, recall that we can solve you know, first order of linear equations, right? That's really easy. If I give you ax plus b equal to zero and a is not zero, then you know that x is minus b over a, right? Also, the quadratic equation. People have known how to solve that since, I don't know, Babylonia or something. I think Babylonia. Uh, so if you have ax squared plus cx, plus bx plus e equal to zero, then we know that x is equal to minus b over 2a plus minus one over 2a square root of b squared minus 4ac. Okay, during the Renaissance, uh, people figured out how to solve the cubic equation. So you have ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equal to zero. And its solution is pretty complicated to write down. But here's what it is, in case you've never seen it. So let's define delta naught to be b squared minus 3ac, delta 1 to be 2b cubed minus 9abc plus 27a squared d. And let's define c to be the cube root of delta 1 plus minus square root of delta 1 squared minus four delta naught cubed, all of that divided by two. And let's take C to be one half of minus one plus I times cube root of three. Then the roots are, let's say X sub I, uh, well, let's do sub k. Minus one over three a, and then b plus c to the k times c plus delta naught divided by c to the k times c. And so here k is allowed to take values in zero, one, and two. And so you get the three different roots of this equation. So this is a mess, obviously, but all you're doing is addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and extracting square roots and cube roots. So uh, a couple of things to say about this cubic equation before we keep going is um, it, or at least a particular case, was first discovered by a guy called Nicolo Fontagna Tartaglia around 1535. Tartaglia is what he was known as, although it's not actually his name, it means a person who stutters. He taught it to another guy called Gerolamo Cardano on the promise that uh, Cardano would not publish it. Nevertheless, in 1545, Cardano published it, or a version of it, Cardano claimed that his version wasn't exactly the same one that Tartaglia had uh, shown him so that he wasn't breaking his promise, but whatever. Uh, in his book called Ars Magna, or The Great Art, which was uh, a really important book in the history of algebra, uh, 
Cardano was the first European mathematician to make systematic use of negative numbers. So just to give you an idea, in the Renaissance, negative numbers were still seen as somewhat dodgy because, you know, what does it mean to have minus two apples? But most interesting, I think, is that not only did he use negative numbers, but he also used imaginary numbers. Right? This was the first time complex numbers were used. And Cardano says something like, well, obviously this doesn't make any sense, right? To take the square root of a, of a negative number, but don't worry about it. Just keep computing and you will end up with the right answer, right? So it's really surprising that even if the solutions to this equation are real numbers, this formula, this way of obtaining them, it'll give you real numbers, but you'll need to use complex numbers to get them. So, you know, it's, it's normal to think that complex numbers are gonna show up historically with people working on the quadratic equation, but that's not what happened. If the quadratic equation didn't have any solutions in the real numbers, then they just said they didn't have any solutions. It's with the cubic equation that people start using complex numbers for the first time, because even with the real solutions, complex numbers show up. Um, that's the cubic equation. The, the quartic equation, at ax to the fourth plus bx cubed plus cx squared plus dx plus e equal to zero, you can also find a formula for the solutions. It also involves only addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and extracting roots, nth roots. Uh, it also appeared, the solution also appeared in Cardano's book, Ars Magna, and there he attributed it to one of his students called Lodovico Ferrari. Okay, so that was the situation in the Renaissance, and nobody had been able to find a solution to the uh, quintic equation, so the same equation, but now degree five. And Abel, in 1824, showed that the reason nobody had been able to find a solution was that it was impossible. There is no formula for the roots of the general equation of order five or higher, of course, involving only those operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and extracting nth roots. An incomplete proof had been put forward by Paolo Ruffini in 1799. And so this theorem is now known as the Abel-Ruffini theorem. Ruffini's proof was incorrect, uh, and 500 pages long, whereas Abel's proof, which was correct, was only six pages long. This topic was later developed by uh, Eberist Galois and is now known as Galois theory. Galois theory is, is more precise. Galois theory tells you, if you give me a specific polynomial of whatever degree you like, Galois theory will tell you whether or not that polynomial has a solution that you can express using only those operations. Whereas Abel just said, well, no, the general one you cannot. Okay, but coming back to his story, after having written a personal letter to, to uh, the King Karl Johan of Sweden, Abel was able to advance the date of his journey abroad. And in September, 1825, he departed Christiana. In Berlin, he met the mathematically interested engineer, August Leopold Krell, who was inspired by Abel, to realize his goal of publishing a math journal in, in Berlin that could compete with French math journals. His journal is still published and highly regarded today and is still known informally as Krell's journal. This was where Abo would publish most of his mathematical work and because he did, the journal quickly gained renown as one of, Europeans, one of Europe's leading journals. Abel was accompanied on his travels by other Norwegian scientists. Most of them were studying mineralogy and geology. And so for these young scientists, the most interesting study areas were around the south of Germany and the north of Italy. Abel followed them there. And so he did not arrive in Paris until July, 1826. He had saved up what he thought was his best work for Paris. And there he wrote what is now known as his Paris Treatise. This work, which was on elliptic integrals and their generalizations, 
has garnered a lot of praise for its originality and depth. He submitted it to the Scientific Academy in October 1826. He continued to live in Paris for the rest of the year, waiting to hear back from the Scientific Academy of what they thought about his treatise. But it turns out the referees of the treatise had lost it. Abel started running out of funds. He rationed himself to having only one meal a day, and this was not good for his health. He started to feel ill with a fever and a cough. It turns out he caught tuberculosis. He returned to Berlin before heading home to Norway in May 1827. In Norway, he took in private pupils and took out a private loan. He published many math papers in Krell's journal and Krell tried to obtain a position for him in Berlin, but he was suffering from tuberculosis. And when Krell wrote to him, <coughs> excuse me, on April 8th, 1829, to let him know that he had obtained a position for Abel in Berlin, it was too late. Abel had died two days before, aged only 26. The same day that Krell wrote to him, another letter had been sent from Paris explaining that his treatise had been found and containing many words of praise. In fact, the next year, the Academy in Paris awarded its prize to Abel for his work in this treatise, and they sent the money to his mother. Although he was only active in math for six or seven years, Abel has had a large impact in math. One famous French mathematician, Charles Hermite, said of him, Abel has left mathematicians enough to keep them busy for 500 years. The King of Norway's Mathematics Prize, modeled on the Nobel, is called the Abel Prize in his memory. The foundation that awards the Abel Prize also has a prize for teachers of mathematics named after Abel's teacher, the Bernd Michael Pombo Memorial Prize. We'll stop there, pick it up from there next time.